making more effective demonstrations. Possibly no question uppermost in the heart of each of us more than this. How can I more effectively and quickly demonstrate the science of Christianity in healing sickness and sin? At this time, I would like to discuss an important paragraph found on page 367 of the Christian Science textbook, in which Mrs. Eddy described the qualities of Mary Magdalene, which brought to her healing and complete regeneration. This is what is meant by seeking truth, Christ, not for the loaves and fishes, nor like the Pharisee, with the arrogance of rank and display of scholarship, but like Mary Magdalene, from the summit of devout consecration, with the oil of gladness and the perfume of gratitude, with tears of repentance, and with those hairs all numbered by the Father. Let us consider carefully each of these five qualities to see whether we can do anything to bring our thought more completely in harmony with the divine principle, which heals quickly and permanently. Number 1. Summit of Devout Consecration 2. Oil of Gladness 3. Perfume of Gratitude 4. Tears of Repentance 5. Hairs all numbered by the Father. Consider the difference between consecration and concentration. There is much more of the latter in the thought of many Christian scientists than there should be. To concentrate is defined as follows. To bring or come to a common center. To concentrate is to narrow down on something. It means to think of something to the exclusion of all else. It is a limiting, restrictive word and always implies activity of the human mind. Concentration causes wrinkles on the forehead, furrows on the temple, knitted eyebrows and often a headache. Consecration is just the opposite. It indicates an outward and upward thought. It is a process of giving up everything unlike God. Concentration holds on to something as though it were limited, accompanied by a fear of being sidetracked. Consecration gives up every limiting thought and trusts the omnipresence and omnipotence of good, knowing that there is no outside to God's perfection. If we had a rubber ball here which was out of shape and which we desired to put in shape, concentration would have us apply pressure at different parts of the ball to make it round. Consecration would just remove the forces that were seemingly distorting the shape of the ball, and then it would, out of its own accord, go back into its normal shape. When you are trying to do something to yourself, to make yourself well, when you are applying mental pressures here and there, that is concentration. When you have a sick man or a sick woman that you are seeking to change into a well man or woman through your Christian science treatment, that is concentration. On the other hand, when you acknowledge that you are already and always have been God's perfect child, when you are willing and ready To give up any belief to the contrary, that is consecration, for it is outward, upward, 
and toward freedom. If you are seeing your patient as already the perfect manifestation of harmonious being, if your treatment is a process of silencing the lies about God, His universe, and man through the action of eternal truth, that is consecration, for you are giving up every concept unlike God. The verb to consecrate is defined as follows, to make or declare sacred or holy, to set apart or devote to the service or worship of God. Is not this a good definition of a Christian science treatment? You recognize your patient as a very sacred or holy creature, the very image and likeness of God. You see him as set apart from the claim of materiality, sin, disease, and death. In your treatment, you are devoting your every thought and energy to the service of God in the establishment of His kingdom on earth. Your treatment is a process of worshiping the infinitude of good. Consecration always heals. Concentration brings on a mesmeric state which binds and limits. May I illustrate? You attend a Sunday morning service. You are having a hard time following the lesson. You decide you must concentrate on the lesson, and you proceed to do so. You try to get something out of the service. You try to force yourself to stay awake. In the whole process, there is a great deal of a false sense of self. You are doing something. You get sleepier and sleepier until the last section is over and the ushers begin to take up the collection. Then you are suddenly wide awake and free. You blame malpractice or false theology or a late social engagement for the unhappy experience. But ten chances to one, it was only an attitude of concentration rather than consecration which caused your trouble. On the other hand, you attend a service with true consecration. You have prepared yourself for church, recognizing that the word of God shall go forth and heal every member of the congregation. You are completely obedient to the manual of the Mother Church and are praying for the congregations collectively and exclusively. You are not trying to concentrate on the lesson and get something out of it, but you are giving up every thought of a selfhood apart from God. As you listen to the words from the desk, you rejoice that they have infinite healing power for all of those present. Your thought is not inward or upward, but completely outward, upward, and Godward, full of compassion and love for all. What is the result? A very inspiring service for you and more healing for everyone at the service. If ever error does not appear to yield readily to your Christian science treatment, observe carefully whether you are concentrating or consecrating your thought. Wives often concentrate on their husbands to make them over or to bring them into Christian science. Poor men. Parents sometimes concentrate on their children and bring about distorted experiences. Businessmen concentrate on their business associates 
Church members concentrate on the election of certain individuals as readers or board members. This is not Christian science, but rather mesmerism. It never does any good. Concentration is the operation of human willpower. Consecration is a process of letting God's will be done. I am sure you can see that concentration or human willpower is employed by hypnotism, psychology, psychiatry, psychoanalysis, psychosomatic medicine, medical science, and false theology. Only the scientific Christian knows what consecration is and how it heals the sick and the sinning. The summit of devout consecration. Please note that word summit. We are not climbing up the mountain of consecration with the hope that some day we may be at the summit. We must, as God's children, be at the summit now. A little more consecration than yesterday will not bring instantaneous healings, but absolute consecration will do what is expected from a Christian science treatment. On page 242 of the First Church of Christ Scientist and Miscellany, our leader has written, Christian science is absolute. It is neither behind the point of perfection nor advancing towards it. It is at this point and must be practiced therefrom. I would like to emphasize this point. In your application of Christian science, make certain that you are not employing the psychology of Emil Coe. Every day, in every way, I get better and better. That is concentration, because it begins with imperfection and seeks to evolve perfection therefrom. Instead, practice the religion of John. Now are we the sons of God. That is consecration, because it begins and ends with eternal perfection. Now let us turn to the second quality of Mary Magdalene, which brought about her healing, the oil of gladness. I am happy our leader put the oil of gladness second, because sometimes when individuals seek to become consecrated Christian scientists, they become long-faced, very serious, and sometimes even sanctimonious. Consecration without the oil of gladness, a joyous attitude, a happy, free sense of things, will not heal. Until the discovery of Christian science, this oil of gladness was lacking from most religions. Yet Jesus taught a religion of joy, and he emphasized the importance of a cheerful attitude in the recovery of the sick. You remember how many times he said to his patients, Be of good cheer. On one occasion, he encouraged them, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full and admonished them to see to it that your joy no man taketh from you. In order to have perfect results in Christian science, we must make certain that nothing takes the Christ joy away from us. A burdened, joyless Christian science practitioner cannot heal. When you are bubbling over with joy, you will heal with very little effort. If you should discover one day that your automobile did not have much power, 
it was getting hot and beginning to smoke, and if you also heard a noise in the engine, you would take it to a garage or filling station. What is the first thing the mechanic would do? Undoubtedly, he would lift the hood and pull out the little measuring rod to see how much oil you have. Ten chances to one, he would show that you need lubricating oil. It is said if you will use a good grade of oil, change it regularly, and always keep it up to the mark designated full, you can drive a modern car at least 100,000 miles without taking the head off the motor. It might also be said, if you will use a good quality of the oil of gladness in your thinking, if you will freshen it up regularly, and if you will maintain a good quantity, way up to the full mark, you can live at least a hundred years without an ache or a pain, and with no slowing down of normal activity. Trying to have demonstrations in Christian science without the oil of gladness is like trying to run your car without oil. It just cannot be done. Just as the manufacturer of an automobile has provided a measuring rod or dial to show you the condition of your oil supply, so our Maker has given us an accurate gauge to measure our oil of gladness. This gauge is your countenance. If you want to know exactly how much oil you have in consciousness, just take a look at yourself in a mirror. Do you find a radiant, happy smile? Then you can be sure your oil is okay. But if you find a frown of disappointment, some sadness or self-pity. If there is resentment or anger expressed, you had better do something about it, and immediately. The man who persists in running his car without oil will soon find his automobile in the junkyard. If you are going to persist in being unhappy, miserable, sour and depressed, I would suggest three things. First, take out all the life insurance you can afford. Second, pick out a good undertaker. Third, write your will, because you cannot run long without the oil of gladness. Sometimes people tell me, that they are really happy, but are not very expressive. That is just like having 10 gallons of the best lubricating oil in the world in the back seat of your car, while your engine runs dry. You can be glad you have the oil there, and do not have to go out and buy it, but the oil isn't going to do you much good unless you put it in the engine where it belongs. Just so, all of the joy and gladness in the world is not going to do you or others very much good, unless you express it in your daily living, in the tone of your words and your constant smiles. Do you know what I sometimes have these long-faced, serious, sour patients do? I recommend that they go out and buy a good joke book, the kind you can get at every department store. I have asked them to acquire four or five good funny stories or jokes every day and to use these jokes and stories at home and in their business. This prescription has worked wonders for several businessmen who were becoming too serious. 
You remember what our leader says on page 117 of Miscellaneous Writings. I agree with Reverend Dr. Talmadge that there are wit, humor, and enduring vivacity among God's people. Sometimes individuals say, I just can't be happy or joyful as long as I have this unsolved physical problem, or as long as I have this discord in my home or business. When these problems are solved, I shall promise truly to be one of the happiest and most joyful characters in the world. That is just like telling the filling station attendant, I can't or won't put in any lubricating oil until my car stops getting hot, stops smoking, stops making this awful noise, and until it shows plenty of power, then I shall reward the engine by pouring in oil. The attendant, of course, would laugh at you and tell you you had better make a deal with the nearest junkyard, for that is exactly where your car is going. Let us not deceive ourselves. The reason we have trouble in our bodies our home, and our business is because we have not been pouring in enough of a good grade of oil of gladness. If you were going on a long, hard trip up a mountain, would you drain all the oil out of your car? Certainly not. You would double-check your oil and take some extra along with you. How about when we are in the process of solving what seems to be a difficult problem for ourselves or others? Shall we let our joy, our oil of gladness, be taken away from us? Never. We shall check and double-check the oil to see that we are one of the happiest, most confident individuals in the world. You know what Jesus told us to do when we are going through deep waters or ascending rough terrain. He admonished us to rejoice and be exceeding glad. Blessed are ye, and the word blessed means happy, when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Isn't that the finest spiritual common sense ever given to the world? When circumstances seem to be going a little tough, pour on more and more of the oil of gladness to make things run smoother. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. If Christians would follow this simple advice, it would not be long before there would be no more tough problems. In my practice, I sometimes require patients to go to a mirror once every hour to check on their oil. Some individuals think this is unscientific to look at themselves. Yet they look in a mirror to shave or put on rouge and lipstick. I cannot see why it is unscientific to make sure that they have a radiant smile. After all, a smile does much more to make one attractive than all the lipstick or rouge in the world. And do you want to know something very interesting? When you are smiling up here on your face, The smile carries way down to your stomach and even to the tips of your toes. You cannot smile with your face and frown with your kidneys or pancreas very long. The oil of gladness reaches to every portion of the human system. Last winter, I saw this fact graphically illustrated. 
A good friend of ours was elected as a reader in a Christian science church. I had received a brush tape recorder for a Christmas present, and I suggested that my friend read her lesson into the machine. When she heard herself as we played the lesson back, she was shocked, for it all sounded so sad and mournful. She did not know what to do about it, because the harder she tried, the more mournful it sounded. She was taking her appointment very seriously. I then explained about a smile and the effect it had on the whole human system. I prescribed a mirror, put it in front of her, and had her smile as she had never done before while she read the lesson. You would be astounded by the difference in tone, quality, and expression when we played the reading back. You cannot smile with the eyes and lips and be sad with the vocal cords. It just cannot be done. When this friend read from the desk, of course, she toned down her smile a little, but she retained that joy in her voice. Just so is it with every organ of the human system. A smile in your heart will lubricate your entire being. And so, if you want to be an effective Christian science practitioner, be sure to check your oil regularly. And if you are not sure where to start with your patient, begin by checking his oil. The chances are that is all that needs correcting. The third quality that is needed for healing is the perfume of gratitude. Sometimes we talk so much about the need of gratitude that the expression becomes shopworn and we fail to give the intelligent regard to it that it deserves. Let us face the spiritual fact that there can be no true and permanent healing in Christian science without gratitude. Every problem either you or your patient ever had included within it an element of ingratitude. Ingratitude claims to sour the system, wrinkle the face, wreck the home, and ruin business. Ingratitude is not good because it denies the presence and power of God. Things may seem tough. You may have what almost seems an unsolvable problem. Ingratitude will just make the problem tougher and more unsolvable. One of the first steps always in the solution of every problem is to find something for which to be grateful. You remember how our leader stresses this point in her chapter on prayer, we plead for unmerited pardon and for a liberal outpouring of benefactions. Are we really grateful for the good already received? Then we shall avail ourselves of the blessings we have and thus be fitted to receive more. Sometimes you will find patience who think they have nothing for which to be grateful. Unless you can break such stupid mesmerism, you will not be able to do that patient very much good. If you can help him to open his heart to gratitude, you have started him on the path to complete recovery. Often gratitude is all that is needed to bring about a healing. Judge Green once said at a lecture during the days of depression, If you are so down and out that the soles of your shoes are worn through, be grateful for the uppers. Every patient can find something for which to be grateful, if he wants to, 
and it is your job as a Christian science practitioner to help him so to do. Most every successful practitioner emphasizes gratitude vigorously with every patient. Mr. Arthur Whitney, the lecturer, told me that with almost every new patient he always gives an assignment that he shall list 50 or 100 things for which he is grateful and mail the list to him that very first day. This cooperation on the part of the patient often brings about a complete healing in one treatment. At least it opens the mental doors to an understanding of the reality and presence of good. If a patient fails or refuses to send in the list of things for which he's grateful and calls for further treatment, Mr. Whitney tells him plainly that he is unable to help him further. If more practitioners insisted on gratitude, there would be a lot more quick healings. Sometimes you will find a patient who says, I will be very grateful when I am healed. Or, I would be very grateful if this problem were solved. These when and if thinkers just cannot be healed. You remember how Jesus stood at the grave of Lazarus? He did not say, I would be very grateful, O Heavenly Father, if you would restore my friend. Neither did he say, I will be very thankful when Lazarus comes forth. Instead, he looked up to heaven and cried, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always. It was then that the demonstration was made, and Lazarus came forth. Examine yourself to see whether there is any of that if and when type of ingratitude in your thought. It will hold up healing. There was a woman who called on a number of practitioners in and around Indianapolis for help in the solution of a physical problem. And although the practitioners worked earnestly, there was no improvement. Although she had some means, she told each practitioner, I will pay you if and when you heal me. When she called on me for help, I refused the case, not because there was to be no immediate compensation, for I do a great deal of charity work, but because as long as she maintained that attitude, she could not be healed in Christian science. I told her that I had to be honest with her, myself, and God, and therefore must tell her truthfully that Christian science could not help her unless she used it. And the first step in using Christian science is to express gratitude for the good already received. I am sure that such plain talk did her and Christian science a lot more good than sweet talk, which might help her to coddle the sense of ingratitude which was holding her in bondage. If we do not respect the principle of our healing religion, how can we expect others to respect it? John Randall Dunn tells about a man who came to him for help in regard to a discordant condition of a foot. After the treatment, he informed Mr. Dunn that he could not pay for the treatment because he only had a dime for car fare back to his home. Mr. Dunn suggested that he pay the dime and walk home. This may have appeared as a rather heartless thing to do, but it brought about the man's complete healing, for upon his arrival home, he found his foot was well. May I here say a word about practitioner charges? Our leader instructs us 
to make our charge equal to that of reputable physicians in our communities. There is not a reputable physician in America who would charge less than $2 a treatment. In cities, most charges are from $3 to $5. For Christian science practitioners to charge a dollar a treatment is to cheapen our service and classify it below the cheapest clairvoyants, quacks, or fortune tellers in town. I understand that even most fortune tellers these days charge two dollars. If you do not think the sacred ministrations of your Christian science treatment are worth at least two dollars, please do not ever go into the Christian science practice for the chances are that your treatments will not be worth much more. The dollar today is worth but 45 cents of the 1939 dollar and 36 cents of the 1933 dollar, and so some practitioners are really giving 45 and 36 cent treatments. That is not fair to them, to Christian science, or to the patients. Of course, if you have not effected a cure, or if treatments have been prolonged, you will be obedient to the manual of the Mother Church and reduce your fee. The Perfume of Gratitude, How It Is Needed to Effect a Cure Thirty-six cents worth of gratitude is really not very fragrant. But gratitude is not just a matter of dollars and cents. That is the least important way of expressing it. You can say thank you countless times every day for services, large and small, which are rendered to you. A friend once asked me why I always thanked the elevator boy when I got off the elevator. To tell you the truth, I wasn't conscious of the fact that I did, until it was called to my attention. I told my friend that I certainly appreciated the lift the elevator boy gave me, because I would dislike having to walk up seven flights of steps every day. Say thank you as often as you can to everyone you meet, and especially at home with your family, where you sometimes do it least. This polite and sincere expression of thanks gives your individuality a spiritual fragrance, such as nothing else can. Now I am going to tell you a secret I learned about gratitude during the past year. I hope you will be able to make good use of it. It has helped me a great deal. You know how we all say in science, oh, there are many things for which to be grateful. But often in our tone, we imply there are other things which are not right. Now gratitude for good, already received, is better than no gratitude at all. But it is not the supreme height of thankfulness which heals instantly. True gratitude is not an acknowledgement that many things are all right, but rather a recognition that everything is perfect. One time last year, I was helping a woman with a problem. There were inspiring results. In talking to her, I mentioned we had much for which to be grateful. I thought her situation certainly looked good. She gazed at me in amazement and exclaimed, Good? Hell, it is perfect! Then I looked amazed. That experience put me to thinking. One weekend, when international affairs appeared very discouraging, I worked for some hours on this simple proposition, that everything is perfect. Of course, I reasoned it logically from the spiritual basis that since God is perfect and the only creator, 
Everything must be perfect. Do you mean everything is perfect in Berlin? I asked myself. I affirmed that it was, and that everything was perfect in Moscow, in London, and in Washington. Of course, I had to deny the testimony of the material senses, but that is the daily occupation of every Christian scientist anyway, and he might just as well do a thorough job of it in denying some of the big lies as well as the little petty lies. I kept going over the proposition. I am not just grateful for many good things. Everything is perfect. And when I say everything, I mean everything and everybody, even Joe Stalin and Harry Truman. I went over these propositions until I had a great sense of peace and satisfaction. Incidentally, the papers had a much better report the next day. What are you grateful for? Oh, a lot of things. No, everything. We are grateful for everything, because everything is perfect. Mrs. Eddy says, Perfection underlies reality. Without perfection, nothing is wholly real. That means, if everything is not perfect, it does not exist. It is nothing. That is why it is not enough to say, I am grateful for everything good, because then we are admitting the lie that there is a thing besides good, or God. But when we declare with understanding, I am grateful for everything, period, because everything is godlike and good, we are then truly grateful. Just see what it does to your health, your home, your business, when you, with true gratitude, affirm times without number, things are not just pretty good. Hell, they are perfect. Next, we come to tears of repentance. May I emphasize that it is not tears of self-pity, but of repentance that heal the sick and sinning. There is a great difference. Tears of self-pity destroy and tear down. Even the medical profession has observed a detrimental effect of the tears of self-pity and grief. These tears send poison throughout the system. Watch out for the poor me attitude. When you begin to whine, why can't I make my demonstration? You may be sure those are tears of self-pity. Tears of repentance are altogether different. Mary Magdalene had been wasting her human experience until she met the Master. Inherently, she possessed the qualities of a pretty fine character but she had been dreaming otherwise. To be really healed, she needed to be thoroughly awakened. Through her tears of repentance, she resolved to live differently and better. She was determined to dedicate her whole selfhood to the Christ. All material interests and worldly aims gave way to her divine passion for truth. These tears of repentance gave new meaning to every minute and hour of her daily experience. Because of these tears of repentance, our Master said that whenever the story of his life was told, what she did would also be recounted. 
Now we are humbly grateful for all the fine things each of you has done during the past year. Your demonstrations of Christian science are outstanding. But let us all be honest with ourselves. None of us, neither you nor I, has done one fraction of what we are capable of doing in the way of helping to establish individual and world peace. Let us not indulge in self-condemnation, but I wonder whether it would not be well for each of us to have a few tears of repentance this afternoon. Would it not be well for each of us humbly to rededicate our every thought, word, and deed to the Christ truth? Would it not be well to resolve to work harder than ever for that peace on earth and goodwill toward men? I believe it truly can be said that if the Christian scientists had done what they were capable of doing between 1919 and 1939, there would have been no Second World War. If each and every one of us does what he is equipped through Christian science to do, there will be no Third World War. During the recent conflict, many men went forth into enemy fire and flew planes through dangerous areas with no thought for their own lives and safety. Our men were willing to make great sacrifices in order that there might be a decent society on earth. It was only because of such self-sacrifice at the front and also back here at home that we won the war. It is only through the same sort of self-sacrifice that we shall win the peace. Today I am asking you all to enlist in the Christian army to work for world peace as you have never done before. I plead with you to make better use of your spiritual weapons which are capable of pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. I ask you to go directly into the so-called enemy camp, if necessary, to carry a cup of cold water in Christ's name, and never fear the consequences. I ask you to pour in love on every nation and at every national and international conference. I encourage you to be steadfast in the knowledge that love and justice are supreme. I ask you to have that absolute confidence that your efforts added to the efforts of all other men and women shall bring about lasting world peace. In her message of 1900, Mrs. Eddy wrote on page 2, The song of Christian science is Work, 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 watch and pray. On page 340 of Miscellaneous Writings, she has written, There is no excellence without labor, and the time to work is now. Only by persistent, unremitting, straightforward toil, by turning neither to the right nor to the left, seeking no other pursuit or pleasure than that which cometh from God, can you win and wear the crown of the faithful. She also tells us that we should forget our bodies in remembering good and the human race. If we will do just this, if we will go home and work daily and earnestly for world peace, if we will shed a few tears of repentance because of past lethargy and indifference, 
we shall not be called upon later to shed tears of sorrow, grief, and self-pity because of the loss of a loved one in another war. May I also suggest here that you will help all of your patients a great deal more if you will immediately get them to join this same great Christian army working for world peace. Most people are sick only because they spend too much time thinking about themselves and their own affairs. Their salvation is to forget self. But in order to put self out, a bigger and nobler interest must fill the gap. To work truly for world peace is that nobler life purpose. If you will be a good recruiting sergeant, selling individuals on the true satisfaction that comes from doing something for God, their country, and the world through prayer, you will be an effective Christian science practitioner, and your recruited patients will be healed. There is much selfishness and self-seeking in America that needs to be healed in order to establish world peace. Let us roll up our sleeves and get to work. Only through the message of Christian science can this healing take place. Now we come to the last of these five qualities. Those hairs all numbered by the Father. Think of the compassion expressed in that phrase. Mary Magdalene had been wiping Jesus' feet with the hairs of her head. In those days, as today, women were very proud of their hair. They felt their hair did much to enhance their beauty and attractiveness. I wonder how many women today would use their hair, especially right after a $25 permanent, to wipe the feet of the master. That was the most gracious and loving thing that Mary knew how to do. Mrs. Eddy said it was a special sign of oriental courtesy to anoint and wipe a guest's feet. Is it not inspiring to remember that her love and deed were known to the Father? Yes, every hair was numbered. So is it with each and every one of you, my students. Every deed of kindness, every expression of unselfishness, every effort to help others is known of your Heavenly Father, and you never go unrewarded as the result of reflecting divine love. Some individuals are disturbed about the truth, as expressed in Christian science, that God knows no evil, that he knows nothing about sickness or trouble. They say this fact makes it difficult for them to ask for help. They feel that God's ignorance of sickness and trouble leaves them cold and with a sense of separation from God. This is only because they have not been awakened to the fact that God knows all the good in them. Yes, that every hair of their head is numbered. A child might feel forlorn and unhappy because a parent did not realize his great hunger until the doors were flung open and he saw before him a banquet table prepared by a loving parent who knew how to supply his every need and disperse every suggestion or claim of hunger. Remember that we are never alone. There is always Emmanuel, or God with us. You never give a treatment for yourself or another, but what the Father is right there with you, 
pouring out inspiration and love that is needed for the healing. Mrs. Eddy says on page 7 of Unity of Good, When I have most clearly seen and most sensibly felt that the infinite recognizes no disease, this has not separated me from God, but has so bound me to Him as to enable me instantaneously to heal a cancer which had eaten its way to the jugular vein. God did not know anything about cancer, but he knew of Mrs. Eddy's sincerity, of her love, of her steadfastness in truth. God is also acquainted with you and your every virtue, which is the result of reflecting him in your daily affairs. A few scientists sometimes want to become so abstract in their mental work that they leave out of their thinking the father-mother quality of God. Don't do this, or you will miss much of the inspiration that is needed for good work. Talk to God often, just as you would to a loving parent. But don't waste time talking about evil, your shortcomings, or the shortcomings of others, or you will be separating yourself from Him who knows only infinite good. Rather, tell Him how grateful you are for all the good that is unfolding in your thought and experience, and that of the world. Let him know how sincere you are in your desire to reflect him in all his glory. But most of all, listen for his answers. You will not hear them through your ears, but in your heart. His answers will come in the form of such clear realizations of truth that healing is instantaneous. Speaking on this point, our leader has written on page 411 of the textbook, If spirit or the power of divine love bear witness to the truth, this is the ultimatum, the scientific way, and the healing is instantaneous. In an earlier edition of Science and Health, this is the way our leader expressed it. To let spirit, through the power of divine love, bear witness without arguments to the healing truth is the more excellent way. You can see by these statements that healing by argument is not the ultimate way of healing in Christian science. It is only a temporary method until your thought is in tune with infinite good. The highest form of prayer, or Christian science treatment, is a process of listening to and hearing God's voice in your heart, bearing witness to the perfection of all. This mental attitude, which heals instantaneously, can only take place in your consciousness as you realize God's closeness and love for you, as you truly recognize that your hairs are all numbered by the Father. Mary Magdalene was not alone. God was with her and very interested in her and her complete freedom. None of you are ever alone. God is with you interested in you, your family, your business, and your career. His energy is devoted to helping you be the finest Christian scientist possible. He is intent on enabling you to practice Christian science effectively and instantaneously. Your hairs are truly numbered by your Heavenly Father. 
Here then are the five qualities that will help you to bring forth more instantaneous healings in Christian science. 1. Absolute devout consecration. 2. An abundance of joy and gladness. 3. Unlimited gratitude. 4. A sincere resolve to do your best always. 5. A recognition that God loves you, is thoroughly interested in you, and is always present, enabling you to do a perfect work.